Welcome everyone to the Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Kendra Grams, pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in Hudson, Wisconsin, and your host for our ongoing series of clergy conversations. Uh, today, as we approach International Women's Day, uh, celebrated annually in various countries around the world on March 8th, I am blessed uh, to be with two of my colleagues to explore the role of women in ministry. Here with me today is Pastor Heather Hill, uh, the rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Hudson, and Michelle Arndt, a pastor, author, uh, serving in various ministry contexts over time and longtime resident of Hudson. So blessed to have both of them and their perspectives. Like many professions, ministry has lots of different unique joys and challenges. Uh, and I'm, as I'm sure they will share, uh, being a woman, woman in ministry uh, certainly has even more unique uh, joys and challenges. Of course, while uh, the role of women in the church has been varied throughout the centuries, they've certainly been present. Uh, but we also know that it's only in more recent history uh, that the widespread pastoral leadership of women uh, has begun to take root and been widely recognized. So we're thankful for that uh, and still affirm that there's a diversity of opinions about uh, women's role in ministry. So we'll explore some of that today. Uh, but I wanted to start with the historical experience and the historical experience for both of you of women in ministry. So maybe we'll start with you, Heather, uh, knowing you come from a tradition that has uh, for several decades very openly affirmed women in ministry. I wonder if you could share what your experience was. Did you grow up with women in ministry and how have you uh, come to know or when did you come to know that that was an option for you? I had the amazing privilege of actually growing up with one of the first women who was ordained. She was on staff. I grew up at a church with four priests and she was one of them. Mm. Um, she was a woman in the pulpit leading. I look back and she was in charge of youth and kids and part time while she had kids. But I didn't realize anybody but the Catholic and Orthodox had an issue until I went to college. Mm. So I had a early call to ministry around age 13 or 14. And like I said, she was ordained right when the Episcopal Church started ordaining women in the late 70s. And as I grew up in the 80s, she was there. So it was in college that all of a sudden people said, what are you doing? You can't do that. Hmm. And I was like, well, why not? Huh. <laughs> so I, I had that wonderful gift. And I like to say I'm a, I'm a second generation woman priest because I grew up with one. Hmm. Got it. That's awesome. Michelle, I know you've had a very different journey yes. and been in various contexts. So why don't you share a little bit about your experience of of women in ministry and coming uh, to your current understandings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I grew up in a uh, denomination that even though they had um, made a decision to begin ordaining women in the 70s, um, as a child growing up in the pews in the 80s, that is not what I was seeing. Um, and so I did not grow up in a context where I saw women leading in any of those spaces. I, I can't recall seeing a female ever preach. Um, that carried into my marriage. So my husband, who also grew up in a small conservative church environment in the middle of Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin, um, he also grew up in a church where that was not his experience. So we got married and neither of us had ever even considered that that was, um, that there was another reality. We honestly assumed that men and only men are always pastors. And so it was about 10 years into our time at a local church here in Hudson, where we just began to realize that um, not only were our giftings apparently mismatched according to our gender, um, he was being told like, this is how men lead and these are the gifts men should have. And he was like, I have none of those. And he would be like, but she has all of those. And they would say, yes, but she, she's not supposed to lead. And so it, it became this very confusing weave that we had to really start to dig into personally and it was my time in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship where I finally had um, men and women model to me that there was a whole other side to the story that I had never been exposed to. And so that started to snap some pieces into place while we were doing our own personal um, journey of exploring scripture and seeking to understand where did this come from and how come we were always led to believe there was only one way to do this. 
Very different journeys. Very different journeys. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of show the spectrum. So now, having both been in various contexts of ministry, let's start with some of the joys. What are some mm -hmm. of the unique joys uh, that you think women in ministry experience or even the unique gifts uh, that women in ministry can bring to a context? We'll ping it back to you, Michelle. Um, I think there are a few of them. Um, one is that I, I think in the same way that churches that have been led by men for a long time um, have a unique um, ability to connect with their male parishioners um, in ways that, you know, they can't cross over and do that same kind of connection uh, with a female, um, not quite as in an identified way, right? And so I think for me, it's been a joy to have women in in our pews or in the pews of the church I most recently pastored who were like, wow, I actually can identify with you in a way that is more personal. Um, and in the same way, I think it's important to say that like, um, I think the ideal scenario is a mutual situation because I was always aware of like, oh, but there are men in my pews. And so then who, you know, how do I connect with them and what are the limits of how I connect with them? Um, one joy I would add to that is that, um, you know, I think some men are maybe not sure how to respond to a female pastor, especially if they've never had one. And I experienced the gamut of that in, in the four years that we had our church plants here in Hudson. Um, I think one of the unique joys um, was that there was a family um, with a male who, who was quite resistant, um, going through a lot of stuff in their personal life. And uh, the wife was you know, coming to me and for the first time feeling safe to talk about what they were handling behind closed doors. Um, and he just wasn't there yet. And at one point he just made it clear like, hey, I don't need a pastor and I don't need you to pastor me. But in the last six months, even all the way up until the week that we closed our church in November, that was the family, husband and wife who were most directly under my care. And we actually attended a church nearby this weekend and all of us worshiped together. And I just, it was such a joy to give him a big hug and say, of all the men that I would have thought I would be sharing pews with at this point in the story, it wouldn't have been you. <laughs> and there he was. So a joy. Sounds like a deep joy. Mm -hmm. And Heather, what about for you? What have been some of the joys of- Well, I wanna just emphasize that that's a huge thing. Women all of a sudden being able to share things they never thought they could share right. and receive care for things they never thought they could receive care for. Mm -hmm. It's, I keep seeing it over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think women also bring a slightly different leadership style. Mm -hmm. um, in many Episcopal churches, it was a father knows best <laughs> sort of attitude and, mm -hmm. and still is. And I am much more of a collaborator and many of the women I know love to form teams and committees where you're doing things together. It's a different style of leadership. Mm -hmm. Not that some men don't also have that style, but it tends to come out more in the women. And it's wonderful because everyone comes to the table and we, we specifically pick up on you know, who's not at the table, who's being quiet, who can we pull in, and how do we do this together? It's a different way to look at how you run meetings, how you get together with different things. And I think it's a unique gift that many women bring to being clergy and leading parishes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And it, as you mentioned, there are always exceptions to the wider trends, uh, but I, I echo those. Well, I was joking uh, as we sat down to have this conversation <laughs> about one of the challenges of being a woman in ministry is often arriving places and being handed a lapel mic when you don't have a lapel. Uh, just uh, one of many odd things that happens. But what, what have you experienced over time as some of the challenges of, of being a woman in ministry? I, I think there are those people who just really are like, there's always those who say, you're not following God. You can't follow the Bible. But there's, those are some of the things that you hit every day. Those are the upfront thing. For me, the harder part is, is what some people call the microaggressions, the little digs at you. Um, I can handle somebody coming up to me and saying, well, you're going to hell because you're a woman and you preach. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna pray for you. Yeah. But, but it's, it's the little digs that, that women, regardless of what career or life they choose, whether it's staying home with kids, whether it's out working, whether it's doing both, they face every day. And those same things come up in ministry. And I, 
I find those the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Both inside the church where you think they're supposed to know better, but they don't. We still have a long way to go in the Episcopal Church, but we, yeah. we're, we're trying. And it's, but it's the little digs that really hurt the most, shall we say. Yeah, I would agree with that. Microaggressions can sometimes be more violent. Um, than, than the outward, like, hey, I don't like what you're doing. Well, at least you told me, right? Um, I think sometimes it's the sideways, um, yeah, the sideways behaviors, um, the sideways responses to, I think one of the things I experienced um, recently began writing about it on my, on my sub stack is just this curiosity I have around um, Men who, you know, maybe in their workplace have been very accustomed to working with a female or maybe even having a female boss, but all of a sudden they come into the church and it's, it's like something switches for them and they, they want to believe that they can be on board with a female leading them, but when a female maybe holds them accountable to something or when a female maybe says, hey, can I talk to you? Like, hey, how that went down at the leadership meeting? Like, can we talk about that? Or, um, or even, you know, if, if you need to say like, no, like, no, we're not doing that. I think um, I, I'm really thinking through what I have learned about um, the, the apparently different way, it feels apparent to me that there is men who respond differently to a female leading them in the church than they would perhaps in the workplace. So I think that's a challenge that, that I faced was maybe, um, especially if you're, if you're a female with strong ideas or a strong visionary, um, I think there are men who, who don't think they want to be led, but they really don't. What about the challenges of women leading women? Mm. Have you experienced unique challenges navigating those types of relationships over time? Do you want to go first? <laughs> you could say no, but. Oh, well, th there also are those challenges, and sometimes the hardest people to deal with are those who are, are women, they're like, but why are you not doing the traditional women's roles? Why are you not doing this? Um, along with that is the idea of like, you know, women should always be nice and friendly and smile. And sometimes we do that and we are like that. And sometimes we have to be more serious and, you know. Um, but I, I don't think there's any more challenges with women leading women than women leading men. I think it's, it's universal. I think yeah. my experience has been it, it's more the personalities than it is the gender when it comes to that. When people say, oh, well, women, two strong women can't do this together. I'm like, no, no, they can. Just as well as, you know, some men just click and some don't. But right. often it's, I've experienced it a lot more rarely, but when the women decide that they don't think you should be in your role, it's probably it hurts more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think maybe my observation would be you, you said something that I think I would say yes to, Heather, that it's less about the gender and more about the personality or, or even that person's story or their history, right? So I think we have a lot of wounded people who hide in the pews of our churches. And if you start to kind of, if you start to kind of pick up on what's going on and start to move in towards that, you got to be really careful, right? Because some people welcome that and some people don't. And so I think maybe the difference is, um, I think women respond differently than men when they're feeling threatened. Um, I think, you know, kind of the way that men and women respond to those things looks different. Um, so I think maybe I would say uh, I find women sometimes less able to be completely transparent <laughs> you know I think uh, I think women are pretty good at like oh I'm fine I'm good you know and um, so I think I think helping helping women be honest um, when they're maybe feeling threatened or unsure um, about how they're relating to a female leader in the church um, but it does go across both genders they just respond differently would be my would be my take yeah I hear both of you honoring that every person brings their unique story mm -hmm. um, and their unique uh, experiences to mm -hmm. engagement with something that may or may not be familiar to them. Right. Uh, and that brings its 
whole set of, of questions and wonderings and challenges. Um, so knowing that, knowing everybody's different and everybody has their unique story, have you noticed over time uh, a change in how people engage with women in leadership or how your, mm. the church or denomination you call home does? Maybe we'll ping it back to you first, uh, since there's an established yes. history. How has that well, changed? Well, the, the biggest thing is each parish is different. Mm -hmm. Each area of the Episcopal Church slowly but surely welcomed women. And uh, where I am at St. Paul's, I, I am the first woman priest that they've had, not just a, as a fill-in on a mm -hmm. Sunday. Um, I'm the first woman rector they've had, and it's taking some adjustment. And they're like, oh, what do we think about this? What do we feel about this? there are still lots of firsts for women. Mm -hmm. um, even as the wider church becomes more acceptable, there's still places where I know I couldn't work or places that wouldn't accept me as a woman leading, mm. despite my, my years of experience because of preconceived ideas about who's supposed to be leading and things yes. like that. So there's, I find it's more on a parish by parish basis. Mm -hmm. Once they get to know you, they. You know, I say, oh, okay, well, you don't like this or what, like that about who I am. Get to know me. Let's minister together. Let's worship God together. Yeah. Let's do this church thing together, this community, and then see. Yeah. And often it's, it sounds kind of funny to people outside of church worlds, but funerals and deaths, um, when you are able to be present for them when it's the worst of their life and say, I am here and I'm walking you through this, mm -hmm. you're going to get through and you pray them through that, and you pray their loved ones through those things, mm. all of a sudden they realize, oh wait, God is using you. Mm -hmm. And it takes that vulnerability to see that God is there. And so often I find the challenges come with each new place and the new people learning that, oh wait, God works through women clergy, just as God works through men clergy, and works sometimes in different ways. And those are where the breakthroughs happen. Yeah. And it's each parish, you know, even with the wider structure, each parish has their first as well. Yeah. So yeah. I'm experiencing some of those in, in my time at St. Paul's, and but we are, you know, learning together. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, a few thoughts come to mind for me. Again, I reference the mid '70s being the point at which the denomination I'm currently serving with, um, you know made a decision. We will begin ordaining women. 50 years isn't a lot of time. It sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not. And so I would say that, you know, as I look out across our denomination, I've had a very mixed experience. I've had extremely positive experiences with certain males who have treated me entirely like an equal, um, have welcomed me, have shared their power, have, um, you know, have lifted me up or or kind of raised me up into spaces of, of leadership or opportunity. Um, and then there have been spaces where that has not been the case. Um, I would say that by nature of where we are geographically in our country, the Midwest still kind of, unfortunately, is a little bit more of a holdout in terms of patriarchal um, ideas, and those take a long time to die off. And so I do think that, um, you know, by nature of where we are, and even even by nature of where we are in Hudson, you know, I when I go places, I usually say, you know, people will say, oh, Wisconsin, and I, I think they think I'm on a farm or something, you know, and I say, no, I look out my front window at St. Paul, my back window is like rural Wisconsin. And I think we pull from both of those contexts very equally. I'm sure you both experience this. So I think, um, I think I've had a very blended experience in terms of our denomination, um, you know, having having men and women who really get that we said this is what we were going to do and they're doing it. And then there's a whole other cross section that I think is still just like trying to get their heads around it. Um, you know, my kids have often said, mom, we think you did the right thing, but like, Maybe if you had done it in a city or somewhere else, like, you know, but I, I just want to say this. I think that part of the challenge and the opportunity for us as female, females in ministry, um, somebody's got to break the ground, right? Somebody's, somebody has to be the pioneer. Somebody has to go first, right? And I think if we keep retreating to the spaces where it's already accepted, um, we're leaving we're leaving hard ground in place that needs to be tilled up. And so, yeah, those are some thoughts. 
Yeah, so that kind of leads into my next question of how you think women in in pastoral ministry and in other ordained offices, it's different in every tradition, but as that has increased over at least the last few decades, how do you think that's transformed your churches or, or even the wider culture? Hmm. I got a lot of thoughts, but <laughs> the first and most obvious is that women appear as clergy in popular media. Hmm. They didn't eat when I started this 20 years ago. Um, you can watch a TV show and there'll be a clergy person and sometimes it's a man, and some, it's, sometimes it's a woman. That didn't happen tw even 20 years ago that I know of. Um, so that's, that's one of the most upfront. In, in little things with culture and things, I can now buy women's clergy shirts and yes. clergy dresses. And oh when God. I was ordained 19 years ago, they didn't, they called them women's, but they were basically men's fitting type clothes. Hmm. Um, those are little ways that culture is, is starting to shift. Is it, uh, But go ahead. Yeah, I think my husband and I were talking about this the other night, but he just said, you know, I find it interesting. My husband's been in the schools, you know, across the river in Minnesota um, his whole career. And he said, I find it interesting that the one space where we should be leading the way because of the charter Jesus gave um, to us in scripture. Um, you know, there is neither slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, Jew male nor female. The, one of the spaces where we should be the pioneers, we're still lagging behind a little bit. Like um, my husband made the observation, like it is more acceptable or normal uh, for me to take direction from a female in my workplace but we still see this, you know, like it's still a work in process over here in the church. The very, the very, I don't like to use the word institution, the very organization, the very group that should be leading um, this is still kind of playing catch up. But it is encouraging to see, you know, role models. I remember um, a few years ago, it was before pandemic, I was invited down to one of the local churches here in town that has a school and they were doing like, um, I don't remember if it was clergy or career day. I want to say it was pastor appreciation week. I think that's what it was because it was in the fall. And I was the only female up there. And it was like five other male pastors. And this, and the, all the kids had made like pastor appreciation cards and they could come up at the end and give it to whichever pastor they wanted. And this one little girl walked up to me like she just looked like, oh my goodness, I can give this to you because I see that you're showing me I could be this someday. I still have that card. Um, it's tacked on my bulletin board in my home office. But it was one of those moments where I was like, wow, this is, this is maybe more profound than we maybe realize um, at this stage in the game. Yeah, it's easy after you do it for a while to, to realize sometimes or to forget that it is still a novelty in yeah. so many places, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that we say often representation matters, but that's right. a, a very tangible story of, of why it does. Uh, and your own stories mm -hmm. <laughs> of how you came into ministry do. So maybe as one final question then, an invitation. Um, if you have that little girl come back in a few mm -hmm. years or another young woman come up to you and say, hey, I'm interested in, in ministry. Mm. What's one key piece of advice or encouragement uh, that you would want to give them? Do you want me to go or you go? I'll go. Okay. Um, I would tell them that when they read the Gospels, mm. Foundation of Christ Christian Faith, to realize and to look that the first prophet was Mary. Yes. She proclaimed and her call was the same as all the Old Testament prophets. And yes. then I'd have her turn to the back of the gospel books and see that the first people to proclaim the resurrection, the Easter story that we celebrate every year, were women. And to not let anyone say that God doesn't use women to change the world. Mm -hmm. 
Love that. I'm going to pick that one up and add a little bit more. Um, I think the first thing I would tell a young woman um, is the same advice that someone gave me in 2013 after I heard the first compelling biblical case for women in ministry and went, whoa, didn't know this. Um, I would say do your homework. And by that, I mean wrestle with your own convictions. Don't take somebody else's answer for your own. Like that's just, that's just bad work in any class. Like just do your own homework and come to the conclusion yourself that this is what scripture says we can do. But then my second part would be just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I want to say this very carefully because this might kind of tack into some of the other questions that we've already addressed. But I think one of the pitfalls or... Um, dangers of of women stepping into various places but in our context ministry is um don't do it just because you're tired of seeing only men do it like i said in a recent facebook post the way to dismantle the patriarchy is not to build a matriarchy <laughs> and what i mean by that is like in our denomination um there was a, a booklet that was put out shortly after they began ordaining women called gifted and called and I think what is important to recognize is that um, to be a female in ministry means that you've sought, you've sought hearing from the Lord to make sure that you are gifted in this way, shaped in this way, and called to do it. Being angry that men have done it is not a way to say, I'm gifted and called and belong in the classroom. And I unfortunately have seen and encountered some women who, who feel like that to me. And um, they're just kind of bad advertisements for the rest of us. Um, you know, like in any job that we do, we should make sure that we actually are shaped to do it and feel called to do it, whatever that is. I think that takes on an added importance I love that you brought up the example of Mary Heather because she is a fabulous example of a woman who's gifted and called. I mean, like an angel showed up in her bedroom. Like you can't get much more called than that. And so I think I, that would be my advice to a young woman. Do your own homework and then ask God, like, am I gifted and called to do this? Yeah. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but that was reminding me of uh, being in uh, the classroom on behalf of Junior Achievement recently and oh, teaching yeah. second graders about jobs and the hope that they will both find a job that they have the skills and gifts for and that yes. brings them a measure of happiness. Um, so I think regardless of, of who it is, uh, we join uh, in affirming that desire for all young people. Well, we'll leave it there with my deep thanks to both of you and uh, to all of our listeners. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this conversation, uh, that it will empower and invite you to think also uh, about women in all contexts uh, and the gifts they bring uh, throughout the world uh, as we seek uh, to build a world uh, where all are honored for their gifts. Uh, with that, until we gather again for another clergy conversation, may you all be surrounded in health, wholeness, and peace.